come dream with me tonight. Let's go to far off places and search for treasures bright. Come dream with me tonight. Let's build a giant airship and sail into the sky. Let's watch the ground so far below. Let's watch the birds as they fly by. The butterflies in springtime will lead us on our way. Exploding dandelions will brighten summer's day. And if our dream's a good one, and if our dream is right, then imagination can be real if we will dream. Now that the entertainment world has gone crazy with nudity on stage and on screen, Sid and Marty Croft have quietly packed away the nudes that made them famous and gone on to family entertainment. They have taken over three sites in North Hollywood and have a show business factory of their own with a permanent staff of about 150, turning out amusement park shows and rides, circus and theatrical sets and designs, TV shows, movies, store and restaurant designs, what have you. On TV, they've gone beyond puppets by casting real people alongside imaginary creatures who turn out to be midgets in wild costumes. The Star Tribune, July 26th, 1970. By the time Ken Forsey arrived at the Croft Show Biz Factory, the brothers had already become household names with H.R. Puffin Stuff and Sigmund and the Sea Monsters. They had mastered the art of low-budget television production, drawing in a loyal viewership with colorful sets and characters. They put their hearts and souls into these shows. They cared about them. They cared about making them look as good as they possibly could. Not one of these shows was created in order to bring an existing property to the small screen. They were completely original. I think that was the real thing. Originality, inventiveness, the ability to do a lot with a little, and caring about everything that they put together. Sincerely caring about it and transmitting that love of their work to the people that worked with them who were very, very loyal. There would be at least three Croft television productions that Ken would have a hand in helping bring into existence. After working on the network pitch reel for Land of the Lost, Ken would have lent his expertise during production, in addition to observing how Gene Warren Sr.'s team brought Hua Chang's models to life Ken's attention centered on the process of how everything, including the live-action actors, would come together on screen. Chroma key combines two sources in a selective manner, using blue as the key color. A TV camera is pointed at the live actors on a blue stage. This is one video source. The other source in this case is a videotape machine playing back the background plate. The chroma key switcher combines the two sources, inserting the background plate image wherever blue is visible in the image coming from the TV camera. Since the actors aren't blue, the composite image shows them standing in the background plate image. This composite can be displayed continuously live on television monitors for rehearsal and lineup purposes, and then may be recorded on a second videotape machine. S.S. Wilson, Cinefantastique. Prior to the digital age, Chroma Key was the way to make the impossible happen on screen. Ken took note of this, placing it in his bag of tricks for a later date. But the single most important element of production that Ken learned from seeing Land of the Lost was in the writing department. David Gerald was brought on to be the show's story editor. So he's there to set the tone for the series, hire the writers, and maintain consistency with the universe bible that would have been put together. But he resigns after the first season because he realizes everyone except him seems to have final say over the scripts and where the story is going. The show eventually, like it always does, collapses under its own weight. The third year, somebody got the bright idea to hulk it up, to make it more like Lost in Space by having these visitors from other places come and somehow fall through these portals to this magical land and confound things, and it really lost its integrity. This taught Ken to never give up control of the storytelling, and he never would. 
Even though he'd later on let others produce and direct his creations, he never let anyone but himself have the final word where plot was concerned. Production schedules for weekly television series are normally very tight. Realistic dramas can draw upon vast stocks of scenery and props. Not so with imaginative science fiction and fantasy productions. Frequently, shows that are owned by the same producer will borrow bits and pieces from each other and try to redress them, very often successfully. The picture shows the mountain crater set used in Croft's Far Out Space Nuts. Mike Miner redressed his set for The Lost Saucer. These two shows were produced almost simultaneously, which kept Miner and his crew moving quickly from set to set, making use of miniature pieces many times. Often, sets were cannibalized only minutes after the cameras had finished shooting. The parts were ingeniously reassembled into new configurations. The issue here is not so much one of economy, but the lack of time to build each set from scratch. Imaginative craftsmanship kept each setup looking fresh and unique. David Hutchinson, Starlog. Far Out Space Nuts and The Lost Saucer both premiered in 1975, each running for a single season on competing networks. The former starred Bob Denver, of Gilligan's Island fame, and Chuck McCann, while the latter was headlined by Ruth Buzzy and Jim Neighbors, famous for his role as Gomer Pyle. It's hard to explain to people nowadays what a rut 70s Saturday morning television was. And I can tell you a lot of it was absolute unadulterated garbage. They were going through the motions. They had a cynical attitude towards the kids. When they had to give the little messages, they did a kind of tact on like, okay, we got to say this. The Crofts never did that. When the Crofts had a message like on Lost Saucer or Land of the Lost, they would incorporate it in the show and they would sugarcoat it to make it entertaining. They never once said, okay, you lucky people, here we are. They cared about what they did. They cared about their audience. They cared about the people they were working with. And that love and that care showed through on their shows. Ken was credited on Far Out Space Nuts as effects consultant and on The Lost Saucer as consultant on miniatures. His role would entail helping realize sets described in the scripts. One episode of Far Out Space Nuts called for a penthouse perched atop a mountain. Ken would have assisted in shaping the styrofoam structure and painting it to resemble real rock. Repurposed pieces of plastic made up the base of the apartment, while upside down champagne glasses added a palatial feel to the set. Unlike his time at Wed Enterprises, Ken did not have the luxury of time as many of these sets for these two shows had to be imagined, built, and completed within the shockingly short space of two days. He would do a sketch of it and he would model it up and then he would animate. He did everything about it. As far as armatures and mechanisms and such, he was just a natural at that. Ken was a real talent. I mean, he was exceptionally talented. He was really one of the top guys I've ever worked with. He wasn't daunted by anything. If someone presented something to him, he would figure a way to do it, and he would do it absolutely incredible. He just was a brilliant person, a creative genius in a lot of aspects. We were developing the indoor park theory in an inner city for six years. Then we finally started developing it for Atlanta, and it was going to be on two levels. And what happened was that one night, Tom Cousins calls me up and says, Hey, Marty, do you think you can build this park at the far end of the Omni International? Because we're not going to have a trade pavilion anymore. Within about two days, I gave him a yes, and then we worried about the problems. Marty and Sid are the living creative souls behind the world of Sid and Marty Croft a $14 million multi-level theme amusement park now being built in the Omni International Complex in Atlanta and is, says Marty, a dream come true, a fantastic opportunity, the world's first entertainment park under one roof in the middle of a major city. The park will include a wide variety of live shows, illusory effects, and rides and other entertainment activities which are expected to draw more than 1 million visitors in the first year after it opens in 1976. We're betting our whole company on this, Marty said, and other people are watching to see if it works. The Crofts have made a fortune by having fun and making others laugh, and now they're really going for something special. Maybe Atlanta won't disappoint. Gene Tharp, The Atlanta Constitution, October 17th, 1974. The thing that turns Sid and myself on, because this is where we do agree, is that we're not in it for the bucks. It's not the get the golden run theory. All our careers, we've been trying to warm up the world again. That's our goal. It isn't money. 
we got all the money we need. Uh, I'm happy for Sid. He has a chance to express his creativity in much greater ways than just the puppet shows. The Crofts were no strangers to amusement parks. At the time theirs was announced, they already had a presence at Six Flags Over Georgia, but this endeavor was going to be all hands on deck for their showbiz factory. Everything would be developed, designed, and built in Los Angeles before being shipped over to Atlanta for assembly. There were plans for unique rides and shows themed after the Crofts' popular television shows. Ken would be involved in all of these, but the attraction that many considered the creme de la creme of the park was the Crystal Carousel, conceived in the mind of W.J. Evans. He envisioned a series of rings spreading out from a central point with sparkling, fantastical figures all made to appear larger than life. It was made to resemble ice sculptures. So each figure was made out of clear acrylic resin and then had a hollow center that was connected to the stand that held them upright on the carousel. And then they had lights inside them. So the lighting up above around the top of the carousel shined down and the interior of each creature was illuminated so that it was just an extravaganza of whimsical proportions. Ken was pretty much an ace of everything, a real pioneer with all that stuff. He was just sort of a natural. He looked at it and did. You have this aluminum frame with all bearing joints and all this stuff from auto parts to whatever he can get. He would have this figure that would have a spring and a life to it. I have an incredible brother. I get all these fantastic dreams and he just makes them come true and I don't know how he does it. We have a lot of wonderful people back in Los Angeles and here in Atlanta who are with Croft Productions and they all contribute. Creativity comes from everywhere. You could not have built this world of fantasy here in Atlanta without lots of creativity. Ken Forsey was more than prepared to jump in and help bring Evans's crystal carousel to life. It was time to get to work. Tiny bits of colored glass, twisted wire things, marbles, pearls, and plastic beads, shiny gold and silver rings, tumbling, shifting, falling, drifting, past the magic mirror, each to play its special role as images appear. I escape to this looking glass kingdom, where the common becomes the sublime, where each object touches all others, creating their magical rhyme. This kaleidoscope world of the could be, aimed at the purest of light, encircles the brightest of patterns, bringing forth joy and delight. A castle glow in the sunlight, with spires that rise to the sky, or a carpet that flies to forever, where all of my wishes may lie. A flower that bursts into being, like a crystalline form it has grown, or a shudder that snaps in an instant, geometries not before known. Then as quickly they fall from existence, never again to be found, leaving not more than a memory as the tiny parts tumble around. But each leaving creates a new image, made up of all the same parts, like a picturesque fable of lifetime, as each ending creates brand new starts. So I'm drawn there again very often, to witness new colorful schemes, and watch through its magical mirrors, the kaleidoscope bringing new dreams. I think the Pegasus horse was always my favorite because it was like, I love horses and the idea of a flying horse, I just loved it. And I love the beauty of wings. I love sculpting wings and feathers. The centaur was a killer. The griffin was amazing. The Pegasus was extraordinary. The unicorn was off the hook. The chariot had the face of Medusa and her snakes that were on her head came back and made the rails of the chariot and two large adults and a couple of children could stand in the back of this thing as it went around on the carousel. At Omni International, visitors will take the eight-story escalator up 205 feet above the main floor on a magical ride to the world of Sid and Marty Croft, scheduled to have its grand opening May 26th. The indoor park will boast, among other things, a crystal carousel, which includes 55 mythological figures weighing about 800 pounds each, as well as a 3,000 pound open mouth crystalline whale. The Croft concept centers around the idea of one continuous live show providing rides, humor, sound, and sensory happenings to an estimated 1 million visitors a year. Barbara Thomas, The Atlanta Constitution, April 11, 1976. The world of Sid and Marty Croft was broken up into five different levels. Starting with Fantasy Fair, park attendees were presented with an offering of Renaissance Midway-style entertainment. Tranquility Terrace, 
home to the Crystal Carousel, also featured an amphitheater providing live, impromptu performances. Uptown was where the pinball machine attraction could be found. Lidsville, a fantasy village of hat-themed inhabitants and habitats, allowed guests to feel they had been transported into the show the area was based on. The final destination for visitors was the Living Island Adventure, featuring the characters from H.R. Puffin Stuff, accessed via a creaky mineshaft elevator. While the attractions based off of the Crofts' existing intellectual properties were much beloved, the one that proved the most visually stunning, hands down, was the Crystal Carousel. People step on a carousel and everybody there has the same feeling, the same energy going on. It's kind of a natural pleasure that is universal and they transition to joy. Once you're on and the thing's going and you're circling around and you see all the smiles and laughs and sounds, there is just ultimate pleasure. With adult tickets listed at $5.75 and the per child fee set at $4.75, the world of Sid and Marty Croft immediately suffered from being criticized as not being worth the price of admission. Expecting a full day's worth of entertainment, many were disappointed that after just a few hours, their park-going experience was over. The lack of more Six Flags-esque rides was also leveled against it. One of the attractions that was highly publicized was a pinball machine, and it was supposed to be a visual and audible experience. It was advertised as a thrill ride. And I don't think it went faster than seven miles an hour. It was very, very slow. When I went through it, I personally found it to be an intriguing concept. Most people came off of the ride, unfortunately disappointed, and it had to do with the way it was advertised. I really apologize if they got that impression because Marty and myself are not thrill ride people. We originally had a kiddie park. We now have a sophisticated park, I think, that hopefully will meet with everybody's approval. I'm real happy with the finished product. This has been a great city for us. We feel as much at home here as we do in Los Angeles where we live. The people have accepted us. Now we have to not let them down. And we are here to make this park happen and make this park stay around for a long time. We want this to be part of Atlanta. After just five months of debt-plagued operation, the world of Sid and Marty Croft has gone out of business. With their bank financing cut off and other sources of funding unavailable, Croft Productions Inc. and International City Corp. announced Tuesday that the park would suspend operations effective Wednesday. The park, which was open four days a week, Wednesdays through Sundays, saw its last customers on Sunday. Marty Croft said he had pleaded unsuccessfully with the project's lending banks to reverse their decision. We needed additional time and funding to get through until next summer, said Croft. If we had the capability to get through the winter, we would have prospered. He added, we didn't have the opportunity to prove the thing out. We never will know whether it would have succeeded. DeWitt Rogers, The Atlanta Constitution, November 10th, 1976. To go into this experience where you're looking at minds handing you objects that weren't there or minstrels that were just in their own little world singing to themselves, that was kind of odd for a lot of the patrons. They just didn't get it. While the Crofts theme park venture had a short lifespan, it was a moment in Ken's life that he would never forget. He had gotten the chance to play the role of mentor to a young up and coming artist the way Ellis Berman Sr. had done for him two decades earlier. Getting the opportunity to pass on advice and skills to the next generation of artists was a most fulfilling experience. Ken was a real approachable guy, and he was one of those people who was just happy to sit down and talk to you. And I was young, and I was just so enthusiastic, and I wanted to learn everything. He always just took his time. He never was rushed or put out. He was a real professional. I learned from Ken, really think before you talk and you treat people kindly and always act in a professional way. And when people come to you and ask for advice, you openly give it to them and give it to them in a very positive way where it's not cutting them down, that you're building them up and encouraging them. Are we ready for books that will offer music and sound effects? Point of purchase sales tags that give us an audible message straight from the manufacturer? And magazine advertisements that talk to us? 
Mock-ups of such innovations already exist at the Microsound Communications Corp offices in Woodland Hills. The only question is whether there will be widespread acceptance, but Robert S. Anselmo, president of Microsound, has no doubts. He holds a sleek, compact unit, which he calls a microphonograph, on top of a two-inch, transparent micro record affixed to a page, and it does indeed talk. Loretta Kuklinski, Huerta, The Los Angeles Times. Around 1972 to 1976, I was marketing manager for the Western Division of Denison Manufacturing. As marketing manager, I got in all the leads and they said, why don't you follow this one up? So I went down to the address in Redondo Beach and I met an interesting guy by the name of Anthony Coogan. And Anthony had shown me all of this new technology that added sound to the printed page. And it was called a microphonograph. So I said, gosh, this is kind of interesting. Sam Schulman, who owned the Seattle Supersonics professional basketball team, scooped up the patents and turned it into his pet project. Robert, however, was so enthusiastic about the possibilities related to the new technology that he persuaded Schulman to let him establish a marketing and distribution firm of his own that would work to develop, promote, and sell the product. 42 separate markets and at least seven categories were identified as potential avenues for microsound, with publishing at the top of Robert's list. The owner of Intervisual Inc., the then leader in children's pop-up books, saw the technology as the next step in his product line. So, of course, Robert gets in touch with Ken and says, hey, let's put something together for this publisher that involves Simeon Grieb. And Ken is all in on the idea. But there's only one thing. The main character isn't called that anymore. By this point in time, Ken's gotten tired of the name, and he really likes Fearful's true name. So Simeon Greep is dropped, and Teddy Ruxpin becomes the titular character's name. According to Robert's recollection, the name change occurred due to Ken feeling that Greep sounded too much like geek. But there are, perhaps, two other reasons. In 1966, a satirical article appears using Greeps as the name for an invented species who become the lightning rods of hate in order to rid the world of prejudice. There was also an episode of Hanna-Barbera's Space Cadets where the main characters visit a planet home to a race of beings called Greeps. No matter the true reason, let's just be grateful that the change occurred because Teddy Ruxpin sounds much better than Simeon Greep. The Fisher Price Talk to Me Player, the amazing invention that makes storybooks read out loud. It's a sturdy, hand-sized phonograph that runs on batteries and works with its own special books. To start the fun, the Talk To Me player comes with Walt Disney's Ghost Chasers. To keep the fun going, we've created 17 other Talk To Me books, featuring the voices of beloved characters from Sesame Street, Warner Brothers, and Dr. Seuss. The deal with Fisher-Price proved successful, but Microsound had not been the company that made the deal. As it turned out, Shulman's brother-in-law, without Robert's knowledge, had gone and made other deals, spelling doom for Microsound. Frustrated, Robert had to eventually shut operations down. Ken, however, had learned a great deal about children's storybooks. With the world of Sid and Marty Croft folding after just six months in business, the showbiz factory employees went back to working on whatever projects were brought to them. These ranged from continuing to build sets and props for Croft-produced television shows to orders from third-party companies. One of the latter included the development of dark rides designed to be prefabricated to fit into empty spaces at shopping malls, eliminating the unappealing visual of closed-up stores. But there was more than indoor ideas coming out of the showbiz factory. Indeed, one of the most popular carnival rides was created under Ken's mentorship of younger artists. I go in to see him, and I'm as green as can be, and I'm showing him my work, telling him my interests, and he looks at me and says, I think you're what we're looking for. And I was in shock. So he said, when can you start? I said, tomorrow. He goes, great. So he takes me to the storeroom where they have all the art supplies and says, well, pick out what you're going to need. I'm thinking, I don't even know what I'm doing here. <laughs> he does show me this photograph, I believe it was, of this worm that was to be the front end of a roller coaster ride. He said, we're working on amusement parks, so you'll be sculpting this creature. So I'm picking up clay and tools, and then he brings me to an office. 
and says, Jim, here is your office. And it's coming toward lunch. And I'm sitting there going, how am I ever going to do this? And I kind of pretend through the afternoon, keep the door closed. I'm playing with the clay. So I go in the next day with this wacky worm and I meet with Ken and I show him. And of course, I'm waiting to be fired. He said, Jim, I knew you were the kind of guy we needed. Glad you're here with us. The standard definitions of the word whimsy are an odd, fancy, or idle notion, and curious, quaint, or fanciful humor. But in 1978, Malcolm Kaufman, a former president of Sega Enterprises, and Donald Sawyer, the founder of the original cookie company, felt that a third definition was warranted when they took the fried dough pastry, most commonly known as a churro, and rechristened it as a whimsy. It's 15 inches long, three quarters of an inch in diameter, crisp on the outside, light and airy within, and comes with one of three toppings, vanilla, chocolate, and cinnamon. The entertainment is provided by a three-dimensional animated whimsy works with puppets created by Sid and Marty Croft. The entire front of the selling area is a Disneyland-like factory for production of whimsies. William H. Martin, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner. Churros, cheap. They used to cost 50 cents when we made them, and we probably charged a buck or a buck and a half for them. It's not only what you're eating, it's the entertainment. I think it was somewhat different, and I'm not sure it's been replicated, where you combine fun with food. And this was a takeoff to a large extent, or to some extent, the Willy Wonka phenomenon and brought it down to the store level in a shopping center. When the Showbiz Factory crew had this contract placed in front of them, Ken saw an opportunity for the group to not only do a little tinkering to bring the automated puppet figures to life, but to also let their imaginations explore who these little characters were. The magical kingdom of Whimsy is ruled by a benevolent king who is the most whimsical person in the whole land. For instance, the king can't keep a secret. He loves to give them away, especially if they're good. Now the best secret in the whole kingdom is the recipe for the scrumptious Whimsy which is why His Majesty has decided to share with you. And part of it to engage people is to create a backstory. I think people like stories, whether it's about characters or about buildings or about a pony or a duck or whatever it is. People like stories, and we just picked up on that. The king has sent forth six of his best whimsy workers to start making the whimsy treat for you, and each is quite a character. Waldo heads the whimsy crew and oversees all production. Waldo is a worrywart and perfectionist. That's why every whimsy is more delicious than the next. Wendy is the whimsy works clown chosen to add fun to the batter. Being the silly he is, he likes to ride the egg beater around the bowl like a unicycle. Willie works the bellows which make whimsies light and airy. It's a hard job, but he loves being near the mixing bowl and magical whimsy machine where he regularly snatches samples. Wally drives the whimsy line which he guides through the kingdom collecting vanilla snow, chocolate from the mines, and cinnamon logs which are used for whimsy toppings. A dependable worker for an important job. Widget is Wally's mischievous helper and loves to fool around while unloading toppings from the train. Winnie is the apple of the king's eye, chosen for her reliability to dispense the most secret ingredient, whimsy wonderfulness. Along with joy, sweetness, and bliss, the secret ingredient ensures a perfect whimsy treat every time. One of my enduring remembrances from the Whimsy Works company is our average employee was probably 16 or 17 years old. And at one time, we had probably a couple hundred employees. The turnover rate was something like 150, 200% a year, just because kids get burned out, they get bored, blah, blah, blah. I recall that our turnover rate was something like 15%, one five. It astounded me that we were that good at retaining employees. And I went out of my way to make sure that every Sally, Joe, Betty knew who I was. And I personally greeted them, which at that time, I guess, was somewhat different. The Whimsy Works Handbook assured employees that they would feel a sense of oneness at the company because it was an all for one and one for all business from the top to the bottom. All voices would be heard so that a family atmosphere would exist. While Ken never directly worked for the company, he would have heard about the way in which its owners were running operations. Whimsy Works was one of the final projects for Ken during his tenure with the Showbiz Factory. There was a clear reason for this. Upon finishing the Whimsy characters, Ken realized how he could successfully and finally build puppet versions of the characters who had been occupying his imagination for nearly two decades.
I think it's an indictment of American business that Sesame Street, the first innovative thing in children's television in years, was done by the non-commercial people. The people with all the resources, the networks, said it couldn't be done. Instead, it was done by people who had to go around begging for money. I defy any reasonable adult to look at three or four hours of Saturday morning television on any of the three commercial networks and not be appalled at the way our society is using this incredibly powerful medium on young children. Kenneth Mason, President of Quaker Oats. Dear Mr. Mason, we would like to follow in Charles Ferris's footsteps by being responsive to your suggestions to the networks regarding children's programming. Our company was formed to produce a show titled Teddy Ruxpin to be done using live animation puppets and is aimed at children of all ages. This includes adults. We are dedicated to upgrading the quality and professional style of children's programming and to this end have put together artistic, directorial, and producing talents to create a children's program that addresses your challenge of outstanding intellectual and artistic quality. Ron Burnett. In the early fall of 1978, Ken Forsey formed a partnership with an industry acquaintance named Charlie Kowalski and his friend Ron Burnett, an independent filmmaker with a background in theater production. Their initial purpose was not to produce The Adventures of Teddy Ruxpin. In fact, Ken's partners had no idea what that property even was. There were three concepts that the partners would first try to sell, initially seeking sponsorship from organizations like the Quaker Oats Company. One was called Weekend Warriors, written by Ron, about a group of corporate suits who spent their days off riding motorcycles. The other two were written by Ken, Uncle Waldo's Toy Store, and The Legacy. Uncle Waldo's is an example of Ken using what he already had on hand, forming a story around it. Right before he leaves the cross, he builds this model of a haunted house that was meant to be used to sell potential investors on a dark ride concept. But because the Crofts felt they had no use for it, Ken ended up taking ownership of it. So he's got this model and he's envisioning a show where a quirky man lives in it. And sure, it's a toy store. A few years later, he'd even try rebranding it Weird Waldo's Museum, giving it a sort of horror theme. Legacy, however, was a science fiction story that Ken created from scratch. It involved spaceships, flying saucers, aliens of different sorts, and a sentient machine named Sammy the Robot. Unfortunately, like many independent producers of television programming, unless you are a large established company, regardless of a track record, the networks don't want to talk to you. In contacting the network representatives in Los Angeles, we have been asked to sign over all creative rights to our programs in order to submit them for consideration. The networks seem reluctant to sponsor new talents. They are also reluctant to allow new producers creative freedom, and they almost always insist on using their own director, Ron Burnett. When none of their three projects got off the ground, Ken decided to introduce Charlie and Ron to the Teddy Ruxpin story, as well as to the puppets he had been designing and refining. Ken hoped to build them now and make his long gestating project reality. Charlie and Ron proved incredibly responsive to the idea. Ken called Robert S. Anselmo, and the partnership added a fourth member to its ranks and got itself a name. So we had a meeting in his yard, and we kind of laid out a game plan, and somebody said, well, what are we going to call it? So we came up with a variety of names, and all of a sudden, this little brown squirrel came hopping right up to the table looking for food, and we said, why don't we call it Brown Squirrel Productions? Once upon a short time, some experienced craftsmen who also had families became disenchanted with the methods of cranking out TV programs on a factory assembly line basis. Poor quality stories, scripts, characters, sets, filming techniques, poor budget management, and a lack of caring for the product combined to take its effect on the end product. The TV program watched by the family suffered. This situation has become the cry of the land. TV is being blamed for a wide variety of society's ills. These craftsmen decided that the quality programs are not a thing of the past, but can still be made today. 
Programs that bring back a sense of adventure, humor, and interest with enchanting characters and lovable villains that retain an endearing quality which would be good for all seasons. When Kenneth Mason wrote to them, saying that Quaker Oats did not have the staff or budget to fund programs for television, he added that he had passed along their information to his vice president of advertising. The partners decided, there and then, that they had to directly sell The Adventures of Teddy Ruxpin to a television network. But that was easier said than done. They needed to pitch the concept, and in order to make the biggest impact, the four decided to put together a 10-minute pre-pilot. They again reached out to Mason to explain, even if Quaker Oats could not finance the entire endeavor, the company could help by investing money towards the pre-pilot. Mason was told that Brown Squirrel Productions had already gone about building several of the sets, as well as the puppets of the main characters, a cost of $6,000 a piece. Their asked for funds from Quaker Oats would go towards assembling a film crew and renting space for production. Upon the successful completion of the filming of the pilot, Quaker Oats would have the first right to become an advertiser to this quality family program. Your Fisher Price division would receive the exclusive license to the Teddy Ruxman characters for the toy market and items they currently manufacture. Mr. Mason, as a further reduction of risk, Channel 13 in Los Angeles has said they would like this program as a 90-minute special for next Easter and maybe even a 13-week series. We have been interviewing various syndicated companies who specialize in children's programming and they are all very interested in handling the property. They never hear back from Mason, but because the core elements of the pre-pilot have already been built, the worst possible decision is then made. They shell out their own money to film the thing. We hope the 10-minute pre-pilot will illustrate the advance in filming techniques, set designs, and illusions which bring life to a new class of hand puppets we call the Minikins, which are operated from beneath the stage. They hop, jump, walk, stand, sit, and you won't see the puppeteer. In addition, they can slowly grasp objects in their hands, even frown and scowl when needed. The story had significantly changed by this time. Ken had taken his scattered storyline and streamlined everything into a single narrative. The treasure that Teddy Ruxpin is in search of would become the climax of the story, and he, Grubby, and Newton Gimmick would meet more refined versions of older characters and completely new ones along the way. Teddy is now a member of a species called Iliops. Grubby has eight legs instead of twelve. Gimmick is less of a disheveled hermit and more of an eccentric scientist. Nearly the first third of the script is the same narrative, cleaned up and revised, of the 1972 version of the story. Teddy and Grubby sail to another continent, they're chased by Bounders, saved by Gimmick, and Tweeg is still the world's worst shot. But along with the treasure map, there's now half of a medallion in Teddy's possession, with the words, Spirit, Treasure, Ledge, written on it. The trio sail off in the air sloop with a phony map, courtesy of the wannabe villain, who now has what will become his classic hee-hee-hee <laughs> laugh, but the story completely differs from its earlier version after this. The changes range from small things like Tweeg's wagon being pulled by a cloppid rather than a whole team of bounders, but this was likely a budgetary demand upon the story. Then the journey really goes off in a whole new direction. After the air sloop runs out of firewood, the trio find themselves stranded in a desert where they encounter the golem-like mudblups, who live in underground tunnels because they detest sunlight. The heroes are separated. Teddy and Gimmick are thrown in a cell where they encounter another prisoner. Hello. Hello. My name is Teddy Ruxpin, and this is my friend, Newton Gimmick. My name is Fearful. Uh, fearful? Uh, that's a strange name. It's strange, all right. And it fits me perfectly. I'm not only a coward, I'm also a failure. Fearful, no longer a mushroom-like character, is the moniker of Prince Aaron, son of King Wilford of the land of Naraj, who was captured by the Mudblups while looking for his kidnapped sister, Princess Arusia. The three eventually escape the confines of the prison and hatch a plan to free Grubby, who turns out to have been made to work in the Mudblups' kitchen, preparing his specialty, root stew, which makes everyone but him and the Mudblups sick to their stomachs. Using lit up applesauce jars, they make it out of the tunnels and back to the air sloop, taking off and agreeing to forgo looking for the treasure for the time being in favor of searching for Princess Arusia. As the foursome search for Aaron's sister, they bump into the blue-furred, woolly whatchamacallit, who, upon hearing of their quest, decides not to pummel them. Rather, he decides to tell them about the wizard of Ouija, who may know a way to determine Arusia's whereabouts. But Wooly is too heavy for the air sloop, 
so they all have to trudge through a jungle in order to reach the wizards, and they stumble upon these gnarled, pale little creatures with heads resembling turnips. Hey, you is strolling through our veggies! Eh, uh, eh, uh, veggies? Yeah, man, veggies! You was on our vegetable patch! Oh, uh, I'm sorry, we, uh, uh, didn't know, uh, uh, I thought they were weeds. Weeds? Is you crazy? This is the best crop of brew veggies we's had in years. Brew veggies? Come on, we got an appointment. No, no, you just freeze right there, Fuzzy. Uh, but we really do have to, uh... Hold loose, Father. You wrecked our crop, and that means combat. Listen, you don't seem to understand. We ain't had combat in a long time, and we's ready. But so as to cut down on the number of bruises and scars, you's gonna put your best man up against our best man. After Wooly is chosen to represent the heroes, the Wargles pull a fast one on them by choosing Prince Aaron to represent them. He is thrown into a mysterious pond, becoming the Iron Warrior. The two chosen champions battle it out until they fall into dark purple water, reverting Aaron back to his normal self. Although on the surface this looks like a weird little interlude in the story, Ken is actually developing Aaron's character. The Iron Warrior represents the courage that he has within him that he needs to learn how to draw from. Upon reaching their destination, the wizard refuses Wooly entry into his fortress-like tower, a move likely made so that Ken would not have to build a higher set to accommodate the taller puppet. After Aaron explains why they have come to him, he dips in behind a curtain where, in a small room with an old movie projector and reels of film, sits an individual in a trench coat. Hey, Louis. Yeah? We got any footage on a Princess Arusia? Princess Arusia? Ah, yeah, I think we do. I seem to remember seeing the princess being held by the Gatangs. Okay, put it on the machine and get ready to show it. All right, boss. Louis actually shows up earlier in the Mudblup's caves. He's the wizard's eyes in that he travels around the continent filming whatever he sees. The wizard then shows this footage to those who come seeking guidance from him. So they've got a pretty good con going on. After learning of Arusia's plight, the heroes thank the wizard, pay him, bid Wooly a fond farewell, and head towards the hard to find city the stronghold of the Gatangs, really, the Nargs who Ken had renamed, all lying atop the treacherous mountains, coincidentally, the location of the treasure. This is Ken being able to tie everything together. He has to get the heroes back on track to find the treasure, but also find Princess Arusia. While it seems like it was an easy blueprint to draw, this took him a few years to piece together, but he was patient and it's a great payoff. Bringing Tweeg and LB the Bounder back into the narrative, Ken has the antagonist retain his little old lady gag in order to gain access to the air sloop, bringing all of the main players up to the hard to find city for the story's climax. The heroes eventually overtake several Gatang sentries, donning their armor in order to move about. Due to the Gatangs being nearsighted, a carryover from their dark forest incarnations, the foursome are able to infiltrate the room where Princess Arusia is being held. After freeing her, they find a building described as a shrine, matching the location on the map where the treasure is supposed to be. Teddy finds the other half of his medallion and fuses the two pieces together to form the sentence, only the pure of spirit may find the treasure of knowledge. This hoard of treasure then appears and Tweeg, losing his disguise, goes mad with glee, but something else catches Teddy's eye. It's a raised stone in the middle of the room containing what Ken describes as ceramic discs. As the discs begin to glow, words appear within each of them. Trust, imagination, friendship, bravery, faith, love, and freedom. Ken had decided upon what the real treasure would be. Understanding the importance of those virtues which makes a person whole. Having rescued Princess Arusia and having found the treasure, Teddy and his friends must flee the hard-to-find city before the Gatangs can get their hands on them. As they attempt to fly away in the air sloop, the Gatangs take to airplanes of their own design. To combat their adversaries, Teddy has had Grubby prepare root stew and had slingshots constructed. 
While flinging the sticky concoction, the heroes begin to repel their enemies. But when the Gatangs appear to be gaining the upper hand, the woolly whatchamacallit, the first to ever scale the treacherous mountains, arrives to destroy the airplanes on their launching pads. The battle ends with him hurling himself onto one of the airplanes, plummeting to the ground below. Ken takes us from this incredibly intense battle, and how he was going to do all of this with puppets is beyond me, but it would have looked absolutely amazing, to a somber moment where Wooly is believed to be dead. When their gentle giant regains consciousness, Princess Arusia rewards him with a kiss, causing him to blush and swear to never wash his face again. Everyone is safe, but they begin to reflect upon two things. You know, that little old lady was really Tweed dressed up. Hey, that's right. Nobody else would be caught dead in underwear like that. What are you going to do about the treasure? Yes, the treasure. Tweed really must have wanted that treasure badly. And I guess I did too, once. But after we found it, I don't know. It didn't seem to be as important as before. And the way Tweed was acting, I don't ever want to act like that. I think that whoever left that treasure there knew quite a lot about treasures. Not only gold and diamonds, but also treasures of the spirit. Things that no amount of money can buy. I've found some of those things. And they make all that gold seem just like an illusion. And as Teddy says those lines, Tweed and LB watch all of the gold and diamonds disappear right before their eyes. It's just such a great comeuppance for them, but also very telling of Ken's view on what's really important in life. With the script completed, Brown Squirrel Productions scheduled to film their 10-minute pre-pilot in February of 1979, with three days dedicated to rehearsals and two for actual filming. Monday, February 12th, 12.30 p.m. Teddy in scenes number five. 20B, 20C, 21 through 27, 30, and 32 through 34. 2.30 p.m. All of LB's scenes, including his gag shots. Tuesday, February 13th, 12.30 p.m. Clean up rehearsal on all of Gimmick and Teddy's gags. 2.30 p.m. Clean up rehearsal in Tweeg's Tower on all gags and track shots. Ron Burnett, director and producer. My earliest memory is opening up a closet door in the garage and there was a puppet that was in there and the puppet was controlled by bars and handles that went up inside of him and playing with the puppet controls for Teddy Ruxpin and for Newton Gimmick it was living inside the story as it was being created, and it was cool to be able to play and imagine and ask questions and have input as to what was going on and what was being created. And I didn't have some of the normal toys or didn't want some of the normal toys. Just hang out with Dad. He was making them. Wednesday, February 14th. Camera rehearsal time to be announced. Before the camera is ready, if we need it, we will run another cleanup rehearsal for all concerned. Thursday, February 15th, 7 a.m. call for crew, 7.30 a.m. call for cast. LB can check the production schedule to see when he will be needed. 7.45 a.m. first shot. Rap will come when we have finished for the day. Friday, February 16th. Schedule will be the same as Thursday if we did not finish the shoot. Please leave a number with either Brian or Jean, my production assistants, where we can contact you after post-production so you can see the finished tape at a screening. Thank you. Ron Burnett, director and producer. It's satisfying that, you know, finally after fooling around and going down these unfinanced paths that kind of hindered us, it was kind of nice to see something come together. But I was looking at the next step, and that was how do we get it marketed to someone to create an actual series? The partners put together a proposed budget of over half a million dollars for the full 90-minute film with an additional 15 or 16 half-hour episodes at a total cost of just above one and a half million dollars. There was even talk of taking production up to Canada in order to relieve the financial strain on such an ambitious series. They're all in. They're enthusiastic. 
Ken's the closest he's ever been to seeing his 20-year-old idea actually become something. He's finally gotten to build the puppets of his dreams. Extremely pleased with the finished pre-pilot, the partners immediately began shopping it around to various entities, including NBC, Time Life, and HBO. Hopes were high. These guys are really excited. Ken, obviously, most of all. So much so that he goes and comes up with another movie, hoping to make Brown Squirrel Productions an in-demand company. Robert actually sends the Teddy Ruxpin script and this new one to Howard Goldfarb, the movie distributor who eventually went to prison for embezzlement, hoping to capture lightning in a bottle. Dear Howard, this letter will serve as permission to forward the adventures of Teddy Ruxpin's script to interested third parties for the purpose of funding the film. I am also enclosing another brief script, more terrifying than Alien, called The Seeding, written also by Ken Forsey. The budget for The Seeding would be in the 15 to 20 million dollar range. Alien was produced for about 30 million dollars. All special effects would be designed and directed by Mr. Forsey, who has a proven track record in this area. Both of these projects can be produced simultaneously. You may send The Seeding to interested third parties. Robert S. Anselmo, President, Brown Squirrel Productions. As spring turned into summer, and summer turned into fall, the four partners grew discouraged. None of the organizations they had sent the pre-pilot to had given the project much thought. The closest they came to making a deal was with a Dutch company who toyed around with the idea of funding one-third of it in exchange for worldwide rights with the exception of the United States. But this was a fleeting moment. This hurt Ken, it really did. This was his baby, the characters, the story, everything. And nobody showed any interest. Then when they thought it couldn't get any worse, the creditors came calling. Brown Squirrel Productions had been entirely self-funded by Ken, Robert, Charlie, and Ron. They had invested their own money into the building of the puppets, sets, and props. Cash had been largely used, but when that stream ended, they made use of credit. The four had bet heavily on securing a distribution deal very quickly, but when that did not happen, they were in a bad place financially. With no other choice, they paid off what bills they could and went their separate ways. This would be the last serious attempt Ken ever made to bring the adventures of Teddy Ruxpin to life as a puppet show. He packed everything away, forcing himself to accept that his creation might never be shared with the world. Don't tell me that there's nothing new in the world. Don't tell me it's been done before. To do so supposes that I should not play and keeps me away from the door. The door which, when finally opened, reveals a world just inside, where seeking is done and doing is truth and has no more places to hide. Don't tell me that there's nothing new in the world, for although I am not the first, if I do not open that magical door, I may never answer this thirst. Come dream with me tonight. Let's go to far off places and search for treasures bright. Come dream with me tonight. Let's build a giant airship and sail into the sky. Let's watch the ground so far below. Let's watch the birds as they fly by. The butterflies in springtime will lead us on our way. Exploding dandelions will brighten summer's day. And if our dream's a good one, and if our dream is right, then imagination can be real if we will dream to Come dream with me tonight Let's go to far off places And search for treasures bright Come dream with me tonight Let's meet a lovely princess And stand before a king Let's dream a great adventure and let us live that magic dream. The orange leaves of autumn will crackle in the air. In winter, tiny snowflakes will sparkle everywhere. 
And if our dream's a good one, and if we see it through, then the wondrous dream we dream tonight, someday just might come true.